God is good all the time. Thank you for worshiping at Monumental United Methodist Church in Old Town, Portsmouth. My name is Celeste Heath and I'm the pastor at Monumental. We're honored and thankful that you chose to worship with Monumental this third week of Lent. Monumental's ministry is ongoing in our community and around the world because of your generous gifts. Thank you for your gifts through our website, through your online banking bill pay option, or through the mail. Our Lent study is meeting on Tuesday mornings at 1030 in the church conference room or through Zoom on Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. Contact the church office if you would like to participate. On March 26th, Monumental will have a baked potato bar lunch following the worship service. And all of you are welcome to come have lunch and fellowship, and we hope that you will be there. The next Noonday concert will be March 27th and will feature Amanda Kite, who will be singing songs of Broadway. Hope that you will come and bring a friend. Monumental Sanctuary Choir will present the seven last words as a musical offering for the Lent and Easter season. It will be on Palm Sunday, April the 2nd at 4 p.m. Put this on your calendar so you won't miss this musical work during Holy Week. And as always, we ask that you bring a friend with you. On Thursday, April 6th, we will remember Jesus last evening with his disciples with a service at 6.30 p.m. I hope you will come for this important and dramatic time of Holy Week worship. I want to thank the people who make this online service possible. Ellen Comstock is our liturgist. Chris Titko is our musician. Ray Comstock is our videographer and editor. And Bonnie White puts it all together and posts it online. I'm grateful for the work that they do to create meaningful worship for those of us online. On this third week of Lent, we continue our worship series, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places. Our image for this series has been Scrabble tiles, which represent our lives when we seem to have pieces of life that get thrown at us, and we have to figure out a way how to make a good and faithful life with what we've been given. So today, a Samaritan woman meets Jesus at Jacob's well in Sychar. She discovers that it is only the living water that Jesus offers and can quench the thirst of her soul. How do we receive the thirst-quenching waters that Jesus offers us so that we are filled with the love and grace of God? Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship and receive the blessings of our loving and merciful God. series for Lent continues as we contemplate the ways we have looked for satisfaction in things that cannot satisfy. The Samaritan woman at the well in our scripture today found out that the water she came for was not really the water she needed so desperately. This woman had looked for love in many places, in many faces. When she was finally offered a soul-quenching love by Jesus, she became a powerful messenger of good news. Just as the water given by God that flowed in the desert for the Israelites offered new life, the desert of our lives can be refreshed if we look for love regularly at the well of living water and offer life-giving waters to others.
Let us join together in opening our hearts to the love of God. Before we even utter a word, we can be assured God will offer us grace and a way forward. For this reason, we can be honest with what pains us most about our own thoughts and actions. Let us pray. Holy and merciful one, in this season of discernment, we come bringing our deepest longings in our failed attempts at satisfying them. We have often looked for love, for acceptance and security, and the approval of others, giving away the power to claim for ourselves that we are inherently beloved, created by God. We yearn, we yearn for, for lives that matter. matter. We, we desire, desire relationships that thrive. We, we want less regret. regret. At times, we fail to see that you have already given us what really matters, your love and acceptance. You provide opportunities all around us to make a difference in the lives of others by affirming their worth and dignity. You give us a fresh start each day, inviting us to do better. In these moments of silence, we bring to you our pleas for openness to a different way of living. My friends, be assured by the psalmist who reminds us that God is the rock of our salvation, in whose hand is the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains. Let us respond together. We open our hearts, our minds, our souls, our vision to the ways of love created by God, embodied in Jesus, and already moving in us by the Spirit. We are forgiven loved and freed. Amen. Let us sing together. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. If you, if you have a hymnal at home, it's page 127. But the words will be on the screen. Chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, where, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. 
Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock of, at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Our second reading comes from John chapter four, verses five through 42. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give I will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty, thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband. You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then the disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say, for months now, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. 
So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of the, his word. They said to the woman, It's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves. We know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Let us pray. Almighty God, lead us to look to Jesus to be the thirst quenchers, thirst quencher of our souls, that we may be filled with the loving and living waters that he offers, and that we may share that living water with others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, we've had some glimpses of spring, even though this week we're the temperatures were a little bit cooler than the week before. But we need to really be thankful that we haven't been hit with the snowstorms that we have seen on the news in California. As we see the trees start to bloom and the daffodils and the tulips coming up, we start thinking about the new life that is opening up and all the celebrations that springtime brings. Of course, we are looking forward to Easter. It also means that we are at the time of year when many families are thinking about graduations, high school, and college. One of the commencement traditions at Harvard University is senior class chapel. On the morning of their graduation, seniors gather in Memorial Church to hear the minister offer words of solace and encouragement as they take their leave to go into the, their places in the world. The 1998 senior class heard the hard truth from Reverend Peter Gomes. He was a minister at Harvard and a popular author of several books on the Bible and a favorite preacher around the country. Before his death, he was a favorite guest preacher at the National Cathedral. Unfortunately, we lost Dr. Gomes in 2010. But on this particular graduation, in his gentle, ringing tones that, a reminder, that remind you of a cross between a Shakespearean actor and, a and the TV character, Frasier, Dr. Gomes took no prisoners as he began his sermon. He said, you are going to be sent out of here for good, and most of you aren't ready to go. The president is about to bid you into the fellowship of educated men and women and and then he paused, and he spoke the next words very slowly for emphasis. He said, you know just how dumb you really are. And the senior class cheered in agreement. And worse than that, he continued, the world, and your parents in particular, are going to expect that you will be among the brightest and best. But you know that you can no longer fool all the people, even some of the time. By noontime today, you will be out of here. By tomorrow, you will be history. And by Saturday, you will be toast. That's a fact. No, ex no exceptions, no extensions. Nonetheless, there is reason to hope, Dr. Gomes promised them. The future is God's gift to you. God will not let you stumble or fall. God has not brought you this far and to this place to abandon you or leave you here alone and afraid. God has not brought you to this place like the Israels, Israelites because the God of Israel never stumbles, never sleeps, never goes on sabbatical. And thus, my friends and bewildered people, do not be afraid. What Dr. Gomes did for the senior class at Harvard, Jesus does for this woman at the well. As we look at this wonderful Bible story, it's interesting to know that you can go to Israel today and take a journey to Samaria, to the very town of Sychar, a place that time seems to have forgotten. 
Not many people live there, only about 300, and they still consider themselves Samaritans. The primary structure in town is kind of like a cellar, which houses a well, the only source of water for miles. Archaeologists estimate it dates upwards of 4,000 years old. Many weary travelers have quenched their thirst there since the time of the Old Testament Jacob. But even more fascinating than its archaeological significance is the fact that this place has historical significance as the precise location where the Samaritan woman had an encounter with the Christ, with Jesus. It's hard to believe, but the authenticity of this well is undisputed. Samaritans, Muslims, Christians, Jews, they all agree that this is the place where the story took place. As we get into the story, it was noon at Sychar. The disciples went into the village, we are told, to buy food. And Jesus stopped at the well for a brief break from the sun's heat and blistering rays. When a woman of the village walked up, Jesus addressed her. Woman, give me a drink. She was taken back that Jesus spoke to her for two reasons. First, in those days, men did not publicly speak to women. And second, she was a Samaritan, and Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. Jews considered Samaritans unclean. They often called Samaritans dogs. So Jesus had crossed both a gender line and a racial, religious, cultural line by speaking to this woman. So she said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Well, Jesus kind of ignores her question, and he ignores the racial, cultural issue, and he gets to the heart of the matter. And he said, If you had known who was asking you for water, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Jesus is, of course, speaking theologically, which is the only significant way for him to speak. But the woman cannot get beyond the literal part. Oh, go on. She sort of snips at Jesus. This is a deep well, and you haven't even got a bucket. The woman appears to be poking fun at Jesus. You have nothing to draw with, and this well is pretty deep. So just how do you suppose you're going to get this living water of yours? Our father drink, um, Jacob drank from this well. Do you think you're better than he is? Now you can't miss the irony in her sarcasm. Here she's speaking to the Savior of the world about death when her own life is so miserably shallow. Jesus, however, turns the tables on her. And Jesus startles the woman and asks her to go get her husband. With this question, as simple as it was, he totally exposed her dark side, the part that she tries to hide from the world. You know, we all have a dark side. And here, this woman was living a scandalous life. Of course, we already have a hint of that because she has come to the well by herself at noon. You know, early morning was when the women of town came to the well so that they could get there before the sun got too hot. But this woman came at noon to avoid the stares and the glares of the other women. Now the woman is in quite a predicament. Jesus has talked her into a corner. She can walk away with her earthly water, or she can stay and receive everlasting and living water. What steps must be taken for her to find this living water? And Peter Gomes exposed the truth to the graduating seniors. 
He knew their secret. They didn't really know as much as people expected them to know, and now they're graduating and they're running the risk of the jig being up. He puts into words and says out loud all the fears that these young Harvard grads are trying to pretend don't exist and don't want to face. But hearing these fears being articulated and admitted is a relief for them, and they cheer. Finally, someone is being real with them and not pulling any punches. It may not be pretty, but it's the truth. And the truth is life-giving. Jesus has told the truth to this Samaritan woman, and as painful as it may be, it is a relief for her. She doesn't have to hide anymore, and she has been promised new life. She's been promised living water, freedom in Jesus Christ. The Messiah has seen the worst of her, yet has promised to be living water for her, has promised that she will never be spiritually thirsty again if she accepts the life that he offers her. If she's honest and admits the truth about her life, she can have new life and her soul will never be thirsty. And Peter Gomes didn't leave those graduates hanging. He didn't expose their dark and scary fears just to make them feel terrible about their futures. He didn't tell them that they aren't who others think they are just to make them feel like hypocrites. He said, nevertheless, there is reason to hope. Dr. Gomes gave them this hope and this promise. He said, the future is God's gift to you. God will not let you stumble or fall. God has not brought you to this place to abandon you or to leave you alone and afraid. The God of Israel never, never stumbles, never sleeps. Thus, my beloved and bewildered young friends, do not be afraid. And that's what Jesus offered this woman. Hope. New life. Living water. The Samaritan woman at the well found out that the water she came for was not really the water she needed so desperately. This woman had looked for love in many places, in many faces, and when finally offered a soul-quenching love by Jesus, she became a powerful message of the good news. Just as the water given by God that flowed in the desert for the Israelites offered new life, the desert of our lives can be refreshed if we look for love regularly at the well of living water and offer life-giving water to others. Thanks be to God for the living waters that refresh us, that renew us, and fill us with life, love, and hope. Amen. In this season of Lent, we come together in prayer using an ancient form of the church, Kyrie eleison, meaning God, have mercy on us. We'll be led in various intercessions, ending in response, God have mercy. In the, the beginning of our prayers, we will also begin and then end with a simple Kyrie as found on page 2275 of the faith we sing. So let us pray for God's mercy, which is God's love, in our singing Kyrie eleison. Loving Creator, we come to you asking for your living water of life for this planet and all of its creatures. 
You've created wonders and called it all good. Show us how to love that we might participate in the flourishing of this goodness. Show us how to love where there seems to be so much fear. We pray this day for too much water, all those affected by flooding and the unpredictable weather, the war in Ukraine, the aftermath of earthquakes and poverty that, you know, that continues to increase. All of this we pray for today. God have mercy. Loving Sovereign, we come to you asking for your living waters flow in and through our communities. Let us thirst for love, our thirst for love in care and kindness be shown to all, especially those in need. Show us how to love with pictures of mercy raining down water, the potential of this place. Pray, we pray now for Palestine, Ohio, places where water is unsafe to drink and places where the community does not trust governing officials and public safety officers. God, have mercy. Loving parent, we come to you asking for your living water to make our homes and relationships wells of love. Lead us to water in the desert of loneliness. Show us how to love with the depths of your well of mercy, your well of grace. Help us to honor and cherish each other, letting love lead rather than envy or hatred or fear or resentment. We pause in silence as we lift each up in our hearts, each of the relationships that need our love. God, have mercy. Lover of our souls, we come to you asking for your living water in our own lives. Help us to look to you for our worth, for the love that quenches our yearning for acceptance. When we are tempted to search for love in things that cannot love us in return, help us to let go, making room for that which matters. Help us know the lure of your love for us so that we may be your love in the world, in our communities, and in our lives with whom we intersect each day. God, have mercy. And so with your people following the ways of your son, Jesus, who set the pattern of love as right relationship with each other, we pray with confidence the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. together, Jesus, lover of my soul. If you have a hymnal, it's 479.
into the world looking for love in all the right places. We will look for signs of the thirst quencher, and we will pour out the life-giving water of love wherever we go. Hearts open, minds awake.